Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Legends of Sport podcast and another episode of our Restarting the Clock series. I'm your host, Andy Bernstein, and I'm bringing you this episode from the NBA bubble in Orlando, where I'm covering the NBA playoffs. Our guest today is eight-time NBA champion Steve Kerr. Steve won five championships as a player, three as a member of the Chicago Bulls' second three-peat, and two with the San Antonio Spurs. Steve moved from the court to the broadcast booth to the front office to his current position as head coach of the Golden State Warriors, where he's won three championships so far. His Warriors did not participate in the NBA bubble and will be holding a mini camp later this month. Steve's excited to get back on the court with his team and see some old faces and some new faces. Steve and I go way back. We had some fun talking about his passion for baseball as a youngster, his playing days at the University of Arizona under the late Lute Olson, the Last Dance Bulls, as well as his coaching philosophy and his views on social justice, Black Lives Matter, and gun control. Steve also shared some thoughts about playing and coaching against the late, great Kobe Bryant. It was fun catching up with Steve. Enjoy our conversation. And as always, I will see you on the backside. Welcome, oh. Coach Steve Kerr, to the Legends of Sport podcast. Uh, I'm in the bubble, and you're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> Egg, you're it. How you doing, man? How's things going? I'm doing all right. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> Given that we have a global pandemic, I mean, you yeah. know, un under the circumstances, I'm doing all right. But yeah. uh, how are you doing? You've been down there a couple of weeks now? Yeah, a couple of weeks. Um, by the time we release it, it'll be probably three or four weeks. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, um, I'm super glad to be back working. I hadn't taken a picture in five months and um, mm. it's a little rusty. And it was interesting watching the games on TV and seeing how they were presented. And uh, obviously it's a different uh, pr presentation with virtual fans. But then when you get here and you're in the environment, it's, it's, it's both cool and it's a little weird. <laughs> you know, it's almost like a video game. But the quality of play is great. You know, the guys are super competitive. Um, I think you could put these guys on a court anywhere and they wouldn't care, you know, if there's fans or not fans. But, uh, you know, I think the NBA has done a great job. And of course, keeping everyone safe, that's first and foremost. Yeah, I'm I'm really uh, blown away by the the uh, the amount of work that the the league has put into it and and uh, the the detail and um, mm -hmm. and then the uh, the dedication from all parties involved. Yeah, you know, like you said, the the games are coming across great. I mean, it's it's so nice to you know to to turn on games, have something to watch, but to see how competitive they are, how compelling they are. And I think the league, you're right, the league has done a really good job of creating an atmosphere uh, for the viewer at home mm -hmm. with the virtual fans and the, and the sound. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and so it's been really interesting. But um, I, I wonder, you know, what it's like as a player for those guys. Like, like you know, the, when you're in the, a playoff game in front of 20,000 fans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either at home or on the road, you know, there, there's this, there's so much pressure. I wonder if, if, if there's a different level of pressure, mm -hmm. um, like maybe it, do they feel the same way? I don't know. I haven't talked yeah. to any players, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm wondering about is uh, yeah. just what the vibe is in the building while they're playing. Well, it's, it's weird because there's a handful of people in the building and I think the pressure probably is the same because, you know, the stakes are the same. You, you win or go home basically at this point in the playoffs. So, and they're feeding off of the energy of their teammates more than they would off of, or in, including fans. Mm. Um, and there's a, you know, big TV audience too. So, uh, you know, we've seen some, some game winners at the buzzer. We've seen teams go down in game seven. Um, I felt the same sort of, I don't know, relationship to that, you know, victory and defeat that I did, you know, for years and years when sure. I saw it with fans there. So it, and, and plus it's probably even added to that. These guys have come so far, they've sacrificed so much and then boom, it's over in an instant or they yeah. move on, you know? So, yeah. 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 Um, well, like, the games have been amazing. They, yeah. I mean, it's the competition is, is, uh, is big time. So yeah. from that perspective, I really miss it, you know? Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I'm a little jealous that we're not there, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll be back next year. 
Yeah, well, this I think this is a blip on the screen for the Warriors, of course. I mean, so many things happen at the same time, unfortunately. So your team obviously didn't, is not participating in the bubble. So how are you staying in touch with your team, your coaches? Uh, what's going on? Is there any kind of mini camp plan for you guys? Yeah, we're having a mini camp um, later in September. Mm-hmm. And uh, the eight teams that were not invited to Orlando mm-hmm. were all given clearance uh, by the NBA to uh, to have in market bubbles basically so mm-hmm. all eight teams will will have uh, about a two week span to uh, to have practices in their own markets and um, you know we'll be going we'll be staying in a hotel in San Francisco and and um, no families you know just us in the hotel back and forth to the facility wow. every day and yeah and we need it you know we need the practice I mean uh, we all these teams in Orlando are getting really valuable time together. Yeah. Even the teams who didn't make the playoffs, you know, I watched some of the, some of the teams uh, and the Spurs are playing all their young guards together. And, mm-hmm. and you, you could see these guys blossom over a, a few weeks and we need that for our young guys too. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. And, um, and so at least we're going to get a couple of weeks to practice and get mm-hmm. all of our guys together. And, mm-hmm. and this will be the first time that, uh, Andrew Wiggins and and Clay Thompson and Steph Curry and Draymond Green our our core four yeah are are going to play basketball together so it'll yeah. be uh, yeah it'll be a really important couple of weeks for us yeah so how's the health of of your squad how's everybody doing I mean great, Clay, great. Clay I saw, especially yeah I saw Clay yesterday mm-hmm. um, and he looks fantastic he's uh, strong and and uh and moving really well and uh, feeling feeling really confident and excited about the camp um, you know and, yeah. and he's where he should be i mean he, his yeah. surgery was over a year ago i think it was uh if i'm not mistaken 14 months ago now so uh, mm. he's he's ready to roll and yeah. uh, obviously steph you know came back uh, played one game and then the pandemic hit so um he's healthy and and um Mm-hmm. Draymond is, uh, you know, he's an analyst on TNT, so hopefully we'll get him to come back to his day job. But right. um, <laughs> yeah. you know, everybody's, everybody's, like, you know, should be good to go. Knock on wood. Yeah. So, Steve, I got to ask you, you know, going back and re- doing research, and we always find try to figure out like how the person became who they are and their path and all that. So, I heard from a little birdie, a mutual friend of ours, that. You're actually a two-sport athlete growing up in high school, right? And you you actually pitched at Dodger Stadium. Is that true, or is that not? True? It is true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Twice. Twice. Uh, really? My, my, yeah. My high school team played in the city finals back to back years, yeah. uh, 80, 1982 and eighty three. So uh-huh. much fun. Yeah, but was it true that your ERA was sort of like the speed limit? Is that is that very true similar? What I'm yeah. Yeah. Very very <laughs> close to the speed limit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you we're know, not going to talk about what happened when we got to the city championship. We're just going to talk about getting there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, it's all about the journey, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, but I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that you were, you were a baseball guy. So that's cool. Well, I, work for, I love baseball. Yeah, I, love I worked baseball. for the Dodgers for 11 years from 84 to 95. The last really? time they won the series, I was working for them, believe oh, it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I, grew up, I grew up a Dodger fan. I'm yeah. still a big Dodger and which, you know, I hesitate to admit up in the Bay Area because, you know, Giants fans hate the Dodgers. That's got to be tough. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was uh, it was especially tough early on. And then and then it was a little easier after we won a couple championships. I, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, OK, yeah. I, I got I got a little rope now. There you I go. can admit I can admit I'm a Dodger fan, but uh, <laughs> I'm still I'm still a fan. I mean, my you know, my dad used to take my brother and me to sit in the bleachers when I was, uh, I, I remember my first game, I was five years old and mm. you know, walking up into the bleachers and seeing that, that, that expanse of grass and all yeah, the yeah. fans and the, and the, and the gleaming white uniforms. It's like, Oh my God, this is, this is heaven. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I've been a Dodger fan ever since. That's awesome. Yeah. I grew up in Brooklyn and my whole family with Brooklyn Dodger fans. And ah. my dad used to tell me about cutting school and, Paying yeah. 50 cents for a bleacher seat at Ebbets Field, you know, and all that stuff. So, yeah, we share that did you, same uh, did, you, did you Did you carry forward your uh, 
Dodger fandom to when you when you were uh, working there? I mean, were you did, did you feel like you were a fan, or was it more just your, this was your job and you had to? Well, what's interesting is uh, the team moved the year I was born in '58. Mm -hmm. So it is a, there's a tradition in, in Judaism where you wear a black armband for a family member that dies, and usually wear it for a year. Mm -hmm. And so all the pictures of me as a newborn and infant, all my relatives are having black armbands on. Because, <laughs> so, of the Dodgers. because of the Dodgers, they were so diehard. So I was growing up, I had to be a Mets fan because you couldn't utter the word Yankee in my house. Yeah. I mean, literally, I, I tell this story, you'll love this. I, I traded half of my collection. I was about six or seven years old for a Mickey Mantle card. And I walked in the house. I was so proud of it. And I said, Dad, you're never going to believe it. He said, yeah, bring that over here. Let me see that. And he takes the card and he goes like this. No, <laughs> no. Yes. So never out. bring anything with that logo in this house again. <laughs> yeah, true story. <laughs> so I learned. But um, when I, you know, for everything I accomplished with my NBA career, and uh, it, was, it was becoming the Dodgers team photographer, which somehow validated me to the rest of the family. The fam, it's like, yeah. this is not just a hobby. This guy actually, you yeah. know is reliving our childhood and our life. So <laughs> that's great. You know, Marv, Marv Albert told me that, um, that the way he really got started in broadcasting, he was, uh, he was working in the press box at Ebbets field at like mm -hmm. 10 years old. Yeah. He, he got a job as a gopher, you know, mm -hmm. he, he, he got, I think I have this right. He basically pestered the PR guy and said, Hey, I'll, you know, I'll clean up, you know, and, yeah. and I, and like, I think the guy said, look, I'm not going to pay you, but, um, I'll, if you, if you do the job, I'll, I'll give you the, the corner of the box and you can watch the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Marv would come in and he'd do all his work before the game. And then once the game would start, he and his brothers would actually do fake broadcast <laughs> wow. of the Brooklyn that's, Dodger games. That's from amazing. The and that's yeah. kind of how he got his, uh, his start in broadcasting. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the Warriors owner, um, Peter Goober, who's, you know, friend of all of ours, I told a story on my podcast about growing up in Boston, being a huge Red Sox fan and not being able to buy a ticket, even to the bleachers in those days. And he would just stand out on Yawkey way, hoping somebody would hit a home run or catch yeah. a ball during a, you know, yeah during batting practice. I mean, it's just amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. So Steve, I, I gotta, I gotta send you condolences for, for, and you and the whole Wildcat family for the loss of your coach, your dear coach, Lou Dolson. Um, you. you paid, you played for him for four years, right? And, uh, actually five. Cause I, five. I registered a year with an oh, injury. Wow. I didn't know that in school for five years. Yeah. yeah. And you guys went to the final four in what? 88, right? 88. Yeah. My yeah. Last year. So what was it about Coach Olson? I never heard you talk about this that convinced you to go to Arizona and what was your recruiting process like? <laughs> <laughs> How many yeah. letters did you get? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, very few. That's why I chuckled. But uh, right. yeah, I finished my senior year of high school without a scholarship offer. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was uh, a very, very late recruit. Uh, Coach mm -hmm. Olson took the Arizona job and, and in March, I think, after the recruiting period had already ended. And mm. so he was kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel. I was playing, <laughs> playing in a summer league. And uh, right. I really, I was, a, I was a late bloomer. So I was, uh, you know, uh -huh. I, I didn't deserve to be recruited that heavily, honestly. But yeah. uh, he, saw, you know, he saw me play pretty well in the summer league and he offered me a scholarship at the last second. And, and mm -hmm. so I, he didn't have to convince me. I, I had to just say yes before he could change his mind. Yeah. Well, he saw something in you, obviously. And look how, how all that unfolded. Well, uh, I mean, it, you know, yeah, it all, it all worked out amazing yeah. well. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Last week was tough. You know, the news, uh, even mm -hmm. though we, uh, we knew it was coming. Uh, mm. he, struggling for a little for a little while mm -hmm. uh, I went and saw him uh, Bruce Frazier one of my assistants with uh, the Warriors uh, mm -hmm. who also played at Arizona we drove uh, when we had a game in Phoenix in February we drove down to Tucson to see coach and, mm -hmm. and that was the last time uh, we were able to see him and mm -hmm. uh, and we knew he was struggling but he was great you know he was sharp and and uh, yeah it was so fun to just talk about the old days and old stories and uh <laughs> But um, yeah, with the news last week, there was just this outpouring from his 
former players, not just from Arizona, but going back to Iowa, mm-hmm. Long Beach State, uh, yeah. Long Beach City College. He he really touched a lot of lives mm-hmm. and so made a huge impact for for so many of us. He was an amazing coach and a, a great man. Yeah. I mean, it was a tough week. I mean, Clifford Robinson, who we both yeah. knew and coach Thompson. Uh, Thompson wow. Yeah. Just, yeah. It was one after the other. It was amazing. Yeah. Very yeah, sad. Very, yeah. Very yeah. Very sad week in basketball. Yeah. So Steve, um, in addition to playing and, and being mentored by the great Lou Dolson, um, you also have been around and played for mentored by some of the great coaches in history. I mean, Phil Jackson, Greg Popovich, Lenny Wilkins, Cotton Fitzsimmons. Would you describe your coaching styles like a hybrid of all of these guys? Because it's so different, as we know, and, and everyone listening knows. These are all different kinds of coaches with right. different philosophies. So how would you describe how you, I know you have your own individual style, but yeah. it, what did you take from each of them? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, 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 um, the important thing is to find your own style and be yourself. You mm-hmm. know, players will recognize immediately if you're not authentic. And so you have to be yourself, but, but um, you in, invariably, you, you end up taking things that you learn from the coaches who you played for. So yeah, I took, I took something from, from all of those guys, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the two biggest influences on my, my NBA coaching are, are pop and, and Phil Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think um, so a lot of it's on the court, you know, some of the drill work that, that we use same stuff that I did in Chicago and San Antonio. Yeah. But a lot of it is, is really uh, communicating with players, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, the ability to uh, create a really strong vibe um, and, and culture and, and atmosphere that the players are able to enjoy and thrive in. That's the whole goal for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so to, to, to have experienced that kind of feeling in a lot of different cases for these Hall of Fame coaches it was just a, an incredible way to prepare uh, to coach. Mm. Yeah, you had a great quote um, on NBA.com. You said, quote, I'm, I'm definitely authentic to what I believe in, which is that there should be a joy to the game. It's one of the things I feel strongly about when I first coached the Warriors. I wanted to be fiercely competitive, but in doing so, I wanted the players to feel a sense of joy when they walked into the building every day, which I found very refreshing <laughs> because you don't mm-hmm. really hear in professional sports that word joy very much. You know, it's, all, it's right. about winning. It's about, you know, having a long career, getting a big contract, blah, blah, blah. But it's great to hear about joy, especially in today's day and age and uh, to have that to be your philosophy. And I, I know you really well and I know how attached you are to that word mm-hmm. and, and having your players truly enjoy what they do in their job because, you know, it takes up a lot of their life, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, we, we're, we're really lucky because we have uh, Steph Curry who embodies that, that word and, the, and that, uh, that feeling. I mean, he loves to play so much, and it's really infectious. So, you know, the fact that that, uh, that was one of the key values that I felt as a coach that mm-hmm. I wanted to – in part and, and employ. And here was staff who was already bouncing off the walls, playing basketball <laughs> and, and having right. a good time in life. It was a, it was a really natural fit and an easy, easy fit. But um, mm-hmm. I, I think it's important just because um, it's easy to get wrapped up in the business. Um, it's not, even though it's a dream job, you know, playing in the NBA is absolutely a dream job. Um, it's not easy all the time. You know, you get booed, you get cut, you get injured, uh, you get traded. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that are, you know, pretty tough to deal with. Um, and so remembering what got us onto the basketball court in the first place when we were, you know, seven, mm-hmm. eight years old, whatever it was, yeah. um, that's really important. You know, yeah. just that, that feeling inside because that's what's real and that's what, uh, what, what is tangible. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a great coaching philosophy to me. (laughs) And that seems to be the philosophy of your organization from top to bottom, quite frankly. I mean, you know, I've known Rick Welts my whole career and uh, you know, of course, Peter Goober and everyone else. Um, It's very unique work situation, I think, that really is very holistic and, and takes in the whole person and everything you guys are doing in the community. I wanted to 
to ask a question I hadn't really asked anybody on the podcast about the transition from, from being a player to not being a player. You know, it's mm. not really discussed very much in, in our world. You know, players have a, have a career and then it's over. And one of the missions of Legends of Sport, quite frankly, is to raise awareness about the struggles and the realities of, you know, what happens to an athlete after they're done with their career, no matter what. I saw a great documentary, which I don't know if you've seen, called The Weight of Gold on HBO, which was about uh, what happens to great Olympic athletes when they're done, mm. you know, just, it's horrifying actually. I think our business is a little bit better with preparing. Um, but you, you, so you retired after the 2003 season, right? It was yeah, your fifth yeah. championship. You were 37, right? 37. I think I got the math right. And mm -hmm. you played basketball your whole life, right? So can you just talk about how you handled it emotionally, like prepared yourself? Yeah. Went from well, I was I was luckier than most because I was able to play un until I couldn't play anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I think it's really hard if you are forced into retirement before you're ready to retire. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but at 37, I knew I couldn't do it anymore, mm -hmm. and I had I had, had a, a great 15 year run on on uh, these fantastic teams and mm -hmm. been able to play with some of the great players of all time win championships with these guys. I mean, it, it was, you know, just something I never even um, dreamed about really. So mm -hmm. when, it, when it ended, there was a great sense of um, satisfaction, but um, I, I felt like I was prepared for it um, in a lot of ways because I was really enjoying my life with my family. You know, my kids were, were relatively young, I guess like, 10, eight and five, maybe mm -hmm. somewhere in that range, yeah. perfect age to, to really be around more. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I got right into broadcasting, which helped, you know, it kept me in the league. It, it kept my relationships, you know, going, mm -hmm. just seeing people uh, running into you at the arena, <laughs> you know, once every two weeks, you know, with it during right. a TNT game. And, <laughs> you know, that's the thing you, you yeah. realize you miss. Uh, if you're not part of it, you just all these faces and names and people who you're so used to, you know, just saying hello and and, and chatting with all yeah. of a sudden it's gone. Mm. And so um, for me, I was able to keep some of that mm -hmm. uh, by, by keeping my foot in the door. Yeah. But it's a difficult transition for a lot of people. Phil Jackson used to to say that when an athlete retires, it's like a death and you actually have to mourn the loss of mm that piece of you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I yeah. think that's, that's really uh, an appropriate metaphor because it, it, in many ways, if you're an athlete, you know, it, it, it defines your daily routine, your daily ritual for, for years, decades. And yeah. all of a sudden it's gone. It is like, like it's just died and yeah. you have to make up for that loss somehow. Mm. Do you feel like the NBA, especially uh, warriors specifically, I mean, are, trying to prepare players for post retirement post, you know, the next life. Um, you know, I think the NBA does a really good job of it mm -hmm. uh, through their player programs, um, mm -hmm. players association mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction with the league um, does a lot of, uh, you know, financial planning, career training. Um, right. So as guys begin to think about that transition uh, there are various programs to 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 help prepare guys for what's next. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, the league and and the players uh, association do a, do a really good job, but there's only so much you can do, you know. And and um, as a coach, I I really start to talk to my older guys, you know, as I sense that you know they're getting closer to the end. Whether it's you know David West or Sean Livingston, yeah. Zaza. Julia, mm -hmm. you know, those are conversations I have, you know, uh, during the, during those final seasons, you know, what's, what's next? What do you, you know, how's your family feeling about things? What are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. So there's only so much you can do, but ju I think just having been through it myself, it's, mm -hmm. it, I can at least serve as um, kind of a, a sounding board mm -hmm. for these guys as they begin to face it. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you talked about that. Um, you know, there's been such a rise in mental health awareness across the board in sports mm -hmm. recently. And um, I don't know if you heard, but I recently interviewed Jerry West, 
who was working with the Warriors for a long time. And, you know, get Jerry had that amazing book that came out almost 10 years ago, kind of paved the way for mental health awareness. I mean, Jerry didn't have to share that, especially yeah. at his age, but he did. And here in the bubble, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the effects of this unique situation on players' mental health, um, as well as all the social justice issues and political issues that are just, you know, going on around the world and in our, in our country. And yet we're here in this bubble. It's a little bit surreal almost, you know, you know, when Phil came to the Lakers, uh, I'm remembering that he brought a team psychologist with him, Mm -hmm. which I thought was different and interesting. My dad was a psychologist and he actually was sort of a beginnings of a sports psychologist back in the day. When you played Steve, were mental health issues like really discussed, um, open they weren't discussed openly right i mean it was kind of uh, they weren't discussed right? very openly and i think yeah. it was um probably mid 90s mm-hmm. uh, when the teams started to employ team psychologists yeah um, and generally speaking just as we do with the warriors you know um you hire someone with complete uh, confidentiality in terms of you know, you give the players access, mm-hmm. but you don't you don't know anything that's that's happening. So you want to provide your mm-hmm. players the comfort level of knowing you, here's someone you can talk with. Mm-hmm. This will not affect you know anything about your job. Nobody's going to tell us anything. You know, so yeah. you can you can talk to this person about anything you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that's a it's a, a really good resource but it's also disconnected in many ways from the team. So I think Mm. there's, I think there's a, there's a role uh, beyond that. I think having a team psychologist is great. One that one who is separate from the group for confidentiality purposes, but I think there, there's a role for someone who's more um, invested in mindfulness training, um, you know, things that are directly related to your performance mm-hmm. that you can figure out how to use on the court. And so it's it's sort of a hybrid uh, role where you it might be a semi-coach, um, semi-team psychologist, that sort of thing. So yeah, I, th- I, think, um, I think it's, uh, every team has to sort through this dynamic and it's gotten trickier and trickier. I mean, you mentioned just the state of the world right now. Yeah. It's very challenging, and then I think the you know the the, the aspect of sh- social media and the impact that has on everybody, not just professional athletes, but just the, this, the entire younger generation. You know, growing up yes. with this uh, this constant feeling of judgment, uh, this, this not not even daily, but you know by the by the hour, by the minute. People are judging each other and, and criticizing one another. And mm-hmm. uh, imagine being being a young person trying to navigate your way through that and, and feeling shamed by your peers or, you know, you're making a mistake, which we all do, mm-hmm. and in, having it end, ending up on social media. These are really difficult issues, and, and um, it's important that we address them in the NBA, but it's important that we address them um, for everybody out there in terms yeah. of mental health. Yeah, for sure. Steve, you've been um, extremely vocal about social justice issues, getting out the vote, gun control. Uh, You work for an organization that's at the forefront of equality and inclusion. And I want to read this quote you said recently. You said, quote, "I, I think that's our job really is to make sure that it's not just a press conference and a Zoom call and then back to normal business. So I don't, not to get too deep into the, in this podcast, but what's your message to all of us? I mean, you know, about being involved and, and getting the word out and being part of Black Lives Matter, especially as white people, you know, mm. and I'm struggling a little bit with that myself. Like, what can I do as an ally? Right. You know, and yeah. we work around black people all the time. You know, our, our industry is that's predominantly black people. And I, I feel for them. And I feel for them here, especially because you know, they're trying to get their voice out in this unique situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in a nutshell, what, uh, sure, I think, well, I think, I think educating ourselves um, about what's happening and why um, I've been doing a lot of reading during the pandemic. Um, I've had the time to do so, but I've, I've 
I've tried to learn more about um, racism and, and what it what it is. You know, I, I think there's there's always been this sense um, of okay, well, here you know, racism is an act, and I'm talking about my own sense, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think is fairly representative of of the average white person in America. Mm-hmm. That racism is an act. It's um, committing a a crime against a minority. It's, uh, you know, the KKK putting hoods on and burning a a cross and like that's racist. Um, But I I think what I've learned through a lot of uh, reflection and reading and and, and, um, learning from people who who have been kind enough to teach me Mm -hmm. um, that that racism is really a system uh, that's ingrained in American culture. And that as white people, it's it's important for us to understand that and to talk about it. It's really uncomfortable to talk about because our our history is, if you really examine it in this country, is so awful. Mm. I mean, it's 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 awful. And so we, I think we subconsciously just try to put it away and and cover it up. And, and, and hide behind the fact that most of us are not overtly racist, right? We're, you know, I, I consider myself a, a good person. I consider you a good person. Like we're, you know, we treat people well, um, but we are, it, it, we are part of this system that uh, creates um, uh, racism. And so where does it manifest itself? Well, you know, you, you know, get in, get in line, right? There's mm. how many, how many different ways can you say it, but uh, you know, b- bad schools in, in poor neighborhoods because of uh, you know, how our school systems are funded um, uh, healthcare, you know, black and Brown communities are affected um, by COVID much more so than white communities. Mm-hmm. Um, is that my fault? Is that your fault? Well, it's not our fault, but the only way any of this stuff can be fixed is if we actually take part in it. And if we we hold ourselves um, to some sort of accountability and responsibility mm-hmm. to to say, OK, we, we how can we change the system and what can we do to help uh, to create a more equitable system? Yeah, well, well said. Um... I've known you to be a very optimistic person uh, ever since I met you, and 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 even through through the back issues that you had, you know, we I, I wasn't even close to what you suffered, but I always found you to be optimistic that you were going to get through it, and that I saw you coaching in pain, you know, and right now our country's in pain, and are you optimistic? Are you feeling like, you know, the pandemic we're going to get a, a vaccine are we going to get a vaccine for what's going on in, in our systemic racism racism right. problem at some point i mean a change in leadership yes but a lot has to be done right steve yeah i mean it's it's not it's not uh enough just to win an election um, yeah. but i would say that's a requirement uh, <laughs> to start you know yeah. I, I i do fear that if things continue down this path that we're on politically, that we're in we're in some big trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, but historically, you know, we've had in this country we've had some points of inflection, um, such as the civil rights era, where we've had this great momentum, and then we can't get over the hump. Right? Um, I mean, think about what happened in the civil rights era, all the political assassinations and. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Medgar Evers are all killed, not to mention, you know, the, the pre- President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. Yeah. Um, we had the Vietnam War going on. There was so much going on in the 60s and early 70s. And we eventually sort of got to a, a more peaceful place as a country. Mm-hmm. And things calmed down, but we didn't achieve the goals of the civil rights era and the quest that we were on of, of a more equitable, uh, just society. Yeah. The, the hope for me and, and where, I, where I feel inspired is just that I think we've come a long way you know, since then. Um, it, now, we're not, we're, not, we're not there, obviously, but in, in many ways we've come a long way and in many ways we are shockingly inept and horrifyingly uh, still racist. And uh, so I think it's a matter of, of 
continuing to be hopeful and to be active and to and to b- continue to build allies with like-minded people mm-hmm. who want this country to be strong and 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 it's not just about a better life for black people that's a huge part of it but we want our country to be morally sound so that we can all feel good about where we're from and what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish because that's that's what's really going to generate a, a really healthy strong environment for everybody. Uh, we are all living with this sort of this secret that's that, you know, that it's not so secret, but it's sort of it's it's this lie that we've we've been enduring for 400 years, this this uh, this stain um, yeah. that's difficult to to sort of reconcile, you know, that here we are in this land of liberty and justice for all and and all men are created equal but they're not, Mm -hmm. but they're not. And we've got to overcome that lie. And, and we, and the only way to overcome it is to actually address it and Mm -hmm. look it in the eye. Mm -hmm. And, um, usually when I say something like that, my, my doubters will say, well, if you don't like it here, you you should get out. You should go live in another country. That's not the point. No, No. I love, I love America. I love living here, but I want, I want us to be a better country. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Steve, I can't let you go without, Two things. Um, one, we got to talk about the last dance, all right? Because, you know, I lived through it. Obviously, you played through it, uh, the three-peat. Um, you know, the country was starved for sports content, obviously, when it came out. But um, I think it goes deeper than that. I, I was so amazed to see how the players of today were so excited about seeing the Great Bulls dynasty and, and also seeing behind the curtain of Michael and everything. I mean, you know, Michael Wilbon called – Michael basically like the Babe Ruth of this generation because no one played with him. He's kind of this mythical figure, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how would you how would you describe the incredible response to the Last Dance? Well, I, I, that's what made me the most happy was just that the modern generation, uh, not only the NBA players, but the the modern fans, the young generation who love basketball really got an up close look at, at how maniacal and how dominant <laughs> Michael was, you know, yeah. um, for them, he was mostly, a uh, you know, a legend, uh, like Babe Ruth was for us. Although, you know, they've had more highlights to look at, but right. I thought the last dance really showed everybody an up close look at, at just how competitive he was and how dominant he was emotionally over the rest of the league. I think that was important for people to see. Yeah, I think it's inspiring for the young generation to see that. I mean, you and I both know he went a little bit over the top many times, Mr. Jordan, but <laughs> but I think it was a story that needed to be told. And the fact that he allowed that curtain to be open like that was was pretty cool, I thought. You know, he was. And you know, yeah. it was twenty two years in the making. I mean yeah. I, I when that that camera crew was there every day and it was it was very strange because back then you didn't have hard knocks and shows like yeah that. yeah of course it was unprecedented and and uh, to have that kind of access but we never saw any of the footage so you know maybe every five years or so somebody from nba entertainment would i'd run into someone and they'd say uh whether it was andy thompson or dion or one of those guys they'd say hey yeah. you know the, you know, yeah. Spike Lee's got the the content. You know, <laughs> the, the movie may be coming out next year, and like, and then that would go away. And then, you know, a few years later, you know, hey, I hear the Michael stuff might come out. Yeah. And finally, I just forgot about it um, because it had been so long. And so when when it all <laughs> came together, it was actually a, a real treat to watch because 22 years is a long time and to watch yeah. it with my kids and my family was, was a lot of fun. Yeah. Same thing for me. I was watching it with my, my 12 year old, my wife and you know, is me with the hair and the mustache running around behind the seat. It was hilarious. Uh-huh. <laughs> people are texting me, all the people, you know, from the NBA who we all went through it together. Did you see that you were in that shot? Yeah. Or do you remember when that happened or whatever? Mm-hmm. Crazy, crazy. Um, Steve, the last, last thing I want to talk about is, is our dear friend, um, the late Kobe Bryant, um, who we both knew for a long time. You played against him. You coached against him. Do you have any memory, any, Anecdote, little story, anything you want to tell about Kobe? Well, I didn't know him well. You know, I, um, 
he was just one of those uh, rare people who, when you competed against, you you feared, you know. Mm. And they're, they're, obviously in the NBA, there's so many great players, but there are very few who you walk onto the floor as an opponent and go, holy shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to beat this guy? Uh, Michael was obviously, you know, one of those people. And Kobe, to me, is as close to Michael Jordan as as anyone has ever been because of that that drive and that. And and he took so much of his game from Michael, the footwork and you know the, some of the moves, the, the, the turnaround jumper and the, the, mm. the reverse pivot jumper in the lane and all all these beautiful Michael moves he he just adopted. So to play against him. You know, I mean, I I never had to guard him. I had no chance. You know, I I would switch to, I switched on to him a couple of times, and that didn't go well. But <laughs> uh, no, he was. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, as as um, as someone who grew up in Los Angeles, um, I just I know how much he meant to that city, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's just it's still hard to fathom mm. uh, yeah. that he's gone and and uh, how sad it is um, that he's gone, but. Um, he was uh, just a, an incredible player and an amazing presence uh, with the Lakers organization and in the NBA. Yeah, and he left a great legacy too. And uh, it's up to all of us to continue that. And, and I think we are, and I think the players of today are continuing, especially the Lakers, of course, but across the board. Um, so, you know, so revered and so uh, such an honor, you know, to have worked with him. Um, I'm so grateful to have been around him his whole career. So, yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, well, Steve, I can't thank you enough, man. You took a lot of time today. And uh, I, ha- I have to get this in that my, my daughter, Helly, says to say hi to Maddie because our daughters went to Cal together. They actually went in the same dorm as freshmen together. <laughs> so please tell her. Sure. <laughs> yeah, she's doing her PhD at USC. And, you know, Fantastic. who knows what's, at, what's next after that. But uh, I wish you all the best, man, um, especially health-wise. Uh, yeah. And uh, really, thanks so much. And, and thank you to our good friend, Ray Ritter, for putting us together today. We're not going to give Raymond any more credit. I, I'm so <laughs> tired of hearing that Raymond is the, is the best PR man in the business. <laughs> I'm not already, okay? Well, it all starts at the top, right, Steve? So, I mean, if, if you didn't have a good coach to work with. No, that's true. <laughs> I, told Raymond, I, t- I told Raymond last week, I, I, I got a new phone recently. Yeah. And I never noticed this before on my old phone. It must be something new with the update or whatever, but I got a, I got a report, an analytics report from Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, like I said, I'd never seen this before, but the report is, you know, here are the people who you spoke with on the phone the most last week. And it was number one, Raymond Ritter, <laughs> number two, Bob Myers. Yeah. Like Raymond, th- this is a sad commentary. <laughs> We're not I, even, I, I, not even in the season now. So. <laughs> yeah, during a pandemic in the opposite, like, Raymond, I, I, I'm going to take a long look in the mirror and reevaluate everything. Uh, well, got to love him. And you talk about somebody who's dedicated to his job. Oh, my goodness. Best. He, he is the best. Yeah. Job. He's an amazing guy and does, does an yeah. incredible job. Well, Steve, thanks a million, man. And uh, stay well. And we'll see you on the sidelines somewhere at some point, you know. Um, but I wish you and your family well, and thank you for taking the time today, bud. You too, Andy. Thanks for having me. All right, Steve. Take care, man. Well, big thanks to Coach Steve Kerr for joining us on this episode. He's always been one of the friendliest people I've known throughout my career, and I appreciate his time talking with us today. Thanks to our friend Raymond Ritter for helping put this together, and as always, to my researcher and producer, Veronica Ahn. A reminder that we will keep bringing you more episodes in our Restarting the Clock series as I continue to cover the NBA playoffs and finals in the Orlando bubble. So keep coming back every week. You can find us on the LA Times app and online, as well as Apple and Spotify and your favorite podcast platform. Keep following us on Instagram at Legends of Sport, Twitter at Legends underscore of Sport, our blog, legendsofsport.blog, and our TikTok and YouTube channels, Legends of Sport. My photography can be found on Instagram and Twitter at ADB Photo Inc. And I'm posting a lot from my coverage of the NBA playoffs in the bubble. So check out my Instagram as well. Thanks again, everyone. I'll be back next week with another episode in our Restarting the Clock series from the bubble. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and wear your mask. See you guys.